Hi everyone, I'm uh, Simon Gamble. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the president for Mako Networks. Um, Mako Networks uh, makes networking and security uh, devices and products and systems uh, specifically for distributed enterprises. So my goal today is to uh, tell you a little bit about us and hopefully interact with anyone that wants to interact and uh, answer any questions and make, uh, make this a little bit of fun for everyone. But first, let's get through some slides and uh, I'll tell you, tell you a little bit about us. So our mission is to deliver secure networking to the distributed enterprise who are operating at the edge. Um, but first, a little bit about us, and then we'll move on to what we do for these uh, distributed enterprises and what our product is. So um, everything I'm going to talk about today about Mako Networks is falls under our, um, our PCI certification against our technology. So for those of you that don't know or maybe don't care about PCI DSS, the PCI stands for Payment Card Industry. Um, DSS is Data Security Standard, and the Mako technology is PCI DSS certified. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we're the only network vendor in the world that has a PCI DSS certification against the actual technology itself. And so everything that we're going to talk about today has that wrapped up in it. And one of the main target uh, customers that we aim at or target groups is the distributed retail enterprise. And I'm going to focus a little bit about that today. Um, and we'll expand out into some other verticals as well. But one of the reasons that our technology is so well suited to distributed retail enterprises is this PCI certification that we have. We have some big customers too. So distributed enterprises tend to be large. So our customers, um, our largest customers are brands that probably everybody has heard of. And those brands are made up of um, hundreds or oftentimes thousands of small locations. Uh, a lot of these that are shown on these slide decks are distributed retail enterprises. So the thousands of locations are the retail locations that everybody uses every day. And I guarantee that every single person watching this or in this room has been to at least one of these stores or these brands in the last week or so. Now we also get to market through partners. And to us, to Mako, our partners kind of look like distributed enterprises in their own right. So if you think about those brands that I just showed you with thousands of, uh, thousands of locations, our partners are typically deploying to hundreds or thousands of smaller sites in their own right. They could be resellers or MNSPs that are looking after hundreds or thousands of small independent businesses, and they use our technology in, in much the same way that a large brand or a large distributed enterprise uses it themselves. Our technology um, also makes it easy for some of these partners to deliver their own technology. We think about scale computing as a perfect example. If we're doing our job right, we make it easier for Scale's technology to be put into customer locations and to be managed from customer locations. So some of our largest partners are deploying their own technologies, which are really innovative in their own rights, and we, our technology makes it easy for theirs to be deployed. If you think about it, most of the exciting technologies that are in the news every day and that people get pumped about, if the network's not there underlaying everything, those technologies can't exist. So we're all about creating a really solid foundation for the brands that we work with and the partners that we work with to, to be able to deliver some amazing technology that customers use every day. I've used the term distributed enterprises a few times, so maybe we set a few, um, a few rules here or a, make sure we're, all talk, we're talking about the same thing when I, uh, when I talk about distributed enterprises. When I'm talking about distributed enterprises, I'm talking about companies that are made up of a large set of locations, typically small to medium sized locations. Now some of those brands you saw on the earlier slide, you, you know what uh, size their locations are. Um, many, of the, many of the locations are spread around the world, so they're not within the reach of a traditional um, private network. Most private networks are deployed by phone carriers or traditional phone vendor carriers, and they tend to be ge geographically restricted. Um, you know, typically American carriers really only have a solid presence in America, and you know, European carriers the same in their part of the world. And a lot of our, a lot of the the brands and enterprises that use our platform have locations all over the world. So the network that is all over the world is the internet. So our platform is designed to run over that. Sorry, I have a question, maybe very very quickly. Go for it. So you didn't mention the cloud in, in that picture. I mean, all these distributed enterprises have also a cloud presence, and network is you know important also. Yeah. To, to access the cloud. Yeah. So 
in a little bit, I'm going to I'm going to introduce the cloud and Mako Networks. We started in 2000. In 2004, we created our first cloud managed uh, firewalls for small business locations. The, cl the cloud as a term didn't even exist then, so I tend to forget about using a, a lot of these terms that people are now familiar with. SD WAN's another one. We've been doing what now is called SD WAN since 2009. So we create a cloud for these customers, and if you Park your comment for maybe 10 minutes, we'll get to explaining how that fits into the to a customer's environment. So many of these distributed enterprises have a lot of devices, edge devices, devices on their networks that are needing to connect to other places, be able to be accessed and seen remotely. Everything from uh, voice over IP telephone systems, CCTV uh, platforms, Internet of Things services. If you're if you're a business these days and you're running ovens or fridges or freezers, you need to know if they're actually working remotely. So there's sensors and IoT um, components that these guys have in their networks. They're typically running lots of different applications. Um, everything from digital signage, which is a bit of a buzz at the moment and has really changed the landscape of retail, um, through to self-service terminals. You'll notice a lot of businesses from supermarkets upwards and downwards are putting self-service uh, things in there. Guest Wi-Fi, which is becoming really common uh, in markets where vehicle electrification is really starting to take place. People need things to do for 30 minutes when they're in a store. So guest Wi-Fi is starting to expand into different um, areas that never saw them before. And these businesses are trying, or a lot of these businesses are trying to give personalized experiences to their customers. Being able to buy almost anything you want online these days makes it tough for physical retailers to get people into their stores. And technology can help get people into their stores. There are, there are things you can do in a store that you can't necessarily do online in your lounge on a laptop. All of these things we're just mentioning require solid networking for them to be able to work uh, properly. I mentioned it before, but these distributed enterprises are internet dependent. They rely on the internet being up and running in order for them to work. Now, Scale can take some components and, and actually process the data on the edge of the store's network, which can really help with uh, when the internet disappears for a while. But generally speaking, if you're wanting to process credit cards and things in real time, you need your, uh, your internet connection to be up. So these guys all, for all sorts of reasons, need resilient and reliable internet connections. They also require secure networking. So if you're sending uh, credit card data, personally identifiable customer information into the cloud, um, information about stock levels, if you're a gas station and you're sending underground fuel tank levels, all that stuff needs to be treated really carefully and securely. So um, to get information from the edge into a cloud or into another network, that data needs to be transferred in a secure and encrypted manner. Any business that has credit card data flowing on their network needs to be in compliance with the payment card industry data security standard. Again, for people that aren't fully aware of that, the, the, I guess the executive summary is, if you've got credit card data flowing on your network, and you're unfortunate enough to suffer a credit card breach, i.e. criminals steal your customer's credit card data, if you're not in compliance with the PCI DSS, then you're going to be paying everybody back. And that's a major problem. On top of that, there's reputational damage. You know, if you're a major fuel brand and one of your franchisees has a credit card breach, it's not Dave's gas station that gets in the news, it's the major fuel brand uh, brand's name that does. So PCI compliance, while not super sexy, is really important for these businesses to make sure they've got it taken care of. No major distributed retail enterprise is going to do a network refresh without taking care of the PCI DSS part as well. <coughs> Another thing that a lot of people don't think about is these distributed enterprises are using technology everywhere in their business, and yet typically have no one on site who knows anything about it. They don't know anything about networking. They don't know how to resolve any technical problems. They want it fixed, though, because their customers are annoyed at them. And so being able to shift the smart eyes and smart hands in terms of IT to somewhere else and be able to resolve customers' problems quickly and easily when they don't have anyone on, on site who can help is really important, too. So what's the solution for these type of organizations? Guess what? It's Mako. Mako is simple, scalable, secure, and designed to deliver edge networking to these big distributed enterprises or organizations delivering networks to a large number of small sites. We're carrier independent. We don't tie anyone to a single telco or carrier. They can choose 
the, the most appropriate broadband or cellular connection depending on where each individual location is. In a big country like the US, that matters. If you're in California, the type of carrier you're going to get is going to be different than if, than if you're located in Illinois, for example. There's going to be different incumbent telcos, and you want a ubiquitous network regardless of what car underlying carrier there is. Things need to be cloud managed. The IT support is not at the small site. The help desk isn't at the small site. And often there's multiple people and multiple organizations that are responsible for supporting different parts of these customers' networks. So those, that needs to be taken into consideration and we allow that to happen. Our technology, and I'm gonna outline that in just a minute, is built specifically for multi-site businesses or organizations servicing a large number of these small sites. Our technology is entirely cloud managed and, and consists of a combination of network devices targeted at this market that are entirely managed from the cloud. I'll reiterate it again, we're the only network vendor that I'm aware of whose technology is PCI certified. All other vendors are, P are PCI compliant, starts with a C, sounds almost as flash. What it really means is that it's someone else's problem to make that technology PCI compliant and keep it that way. Ours is PCI certified out of the box, which makes it really streamlined to deliver networking solutions to distributed retail enterprises. So let me tell you a little bit about the technology. Like a lot of competing vendors, it consists of those two, two key parts, a range of networking devices and a hosted cloud-based central management system. Some key differences between our technology and everybody else's is that ours have no local management capability on them at all. None of them, none of our devices are sitting there with a web server running on them with a default username and password waiting for someone to log in and configure the things. None of them have any functioning reset buttons, so you can't blow away the security with a ballpoint pen or a paperclip. All of the management control, visibility, and everything is done in the central management system. And that central management system is designed to be used by everybody. Every other networking system that has or centrally managed networking platform when it all boils down to it, there's only a few people at the top of the IT pyramid can, that can have access to that cloud management system. It really doesn't offer a huge amount of value to the distributed enterprise themselves. Our platform's designed to be used by everybody. So a fuel brand, their IT group, can see their entire estate. Typically, the, our customers are franchised. These franchise groups are often large publicly listed companies in their own right. Um, they have technical sophistication, and they want to have visibility and control of their estate. The brand may not want them to control certain aspects of their sites. For example, the point of sale networks, the brand might want to dictate how those are set up, but might want to leave other aspects of the customer's network for the dealer group to be able to manage, and our platform can accommodate that. A store manager may want to get real-time information about his or her store and whether it's online, whether it's offline, whether it's using cellular. Maybe the device is next to a chicken cooker and they want to know when it's overheating. The system is capable of providing the right amount of information to the right amount of people. A customer doesn't have to pick up a phone to get the most basic piece of information because with other technologies, they end up with a box with flashing lights on it that means nothing to them. Our, our network devices... We internally call them service delivery mechanisms. There's value in that cloud for those customers as well as for the brand. So the solution is part software, part hardware in the end. Yes. Uh, does it mean that the network device doesn't work without a subscription or something that uh, I need? Yes, correct. So the, the technology itself is primarily sold by us as a service. So it's a service that happens to include hardware. So most customers don't pay an upfront fee for the hardware. They pay a lower monthly fee spread over the term that, that they want to use the product for, and it incorporates the whole platform. So it really is sold as a service, and that hardware enables the delivery of that service into the uh, retail or office location where it's deployed. So you, you, are, you are also maintaining all the hardware? We are. We're maintaining the software. We're updating features, uh, fixing bugs. The platform is capable of... Um, a larger customer choosing when new firmware is deployed to their sites. There's a there's a complete firmware update tool set that customers can put their devices into specific streams. They can have a lab deployment first, and then the customer can choose when updates go out to their 
uh, live devices, they can choose update windows, how many devices are updated in a specific evening, for example, and things like that. But you're right, the, it, you need a combination of the central management system and the devices. Without the central management system, you can't configure, reconfigure the devices, you can't see what's going on with them. And that delivers the visibility and control we want, but it also adds a huge amount of physical security to the devices themselves. A sizable percentage of our customers, they don't have a secure server room or a locked network rack that's jammed under the counter. And so we want to make sure that if someone can get physical access to the devices, they can't do anything, anything bad to them. They can't reconfigure them. They can't start sending customer information elsewhere. The worst they can do is unplug it. Okay. We have a range of networking devices that are designed for this target market. We're not trying to be all things to all people. We're not trying to be in the head office of American Airlines here. We're, we're trying to be in the distributed enterprise and the distributed retail enterprise. So we have edge, desi edge devices designed for these types of customers. We have wireless APs designed for these types of customers. We have radio shifting devices that can move four or 5G radios and Wi-Fi to a, win to a window when the edge device is next to a brick wall, for example. We have managed switches because most of these organizations that are using our technology require them to segment their networks up efficiently. And then lastly, we have a range of our own VPN concentrators because we have some amazing SD-WAN technology that I'll talk about that require them to be able to terminate in other people's clouds. And they can be deployed either physically or virtually in any of the main cloud providers' environments. And I'll, I'll build up how these all work together in a minute. Quick, sorry, quick question there. Yeah. So for the actual edge devices, do you also support a virtual a VNF? It's a good question, and there's a long answer to that short question. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the smallest long answer I can give you is yes, but we don't currently sell it. So we've been working with partners. <laughs> we've been working with partners where, we, where we've deployed So it's free, images. Is what you're saying. It's, currently it is free, but also unavailable. So the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that out of stock. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yes, the technology works. Yes, we've deployed it onto onto uh, white boxes and things at a customer edge, but we have not commercialized that to date. And there's a couple of reasons for it. I guess the primary one is there's no demand for it in our customer base at the moment. When there is, we're ready to go. Um, yeah, it's as simple as that. So, okay. Yeah. That's PCI DSS certified still. When it is yes, and but it's a good point you bring up right. because it it adds it's part of the challenge of being able to commercialize that right. as well, being able to get that image onto a an uncontrolled device right. in a secure manner. Right. Um, and we have ways of doing that, but yeah, there's a there's a lot of extra steps you have to do to be able to make a virtual image PCI compliant. Right. Versus and you, an entire you know a shrink wrap. You probably have code. requirements on that platform itself. Yeah, we have to control. Yeah, we have to control what the marketplace is like that sells it. We have yeah. to control what devices it's going on. Yep. Uh, we have to make sure it's encrypted. In look. Like, okay. Yeah. You know. Oh, the yeah. answer is yes, but. Yes, but there's yes, but no. PCI, PCI <laughs> always adds extra steps. Well, it, it always. Well, that's why it's PCI. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's a solid foundation. Even for custom, we have customers that don't have any credit cards, credit card, credit card data in their networks, mm -hmm. but they use us because of our PCI certification because it's an independent audit every year that we take security seriously and our product okay. works the way it should. But yeah, it's really burdensome. It's it's hard to get PCI certified every and year. And maybe later on you can explain the difference between your certification. And the that that C companies, you know, attestation to compliance yep. with PCI and, and the difference between those. Yes, yeah, uh, not right now, but yep. later. Yeah. <laughs> Let's show how this is often deployed in a an imaginary retail location, for example. So we have our edge device. This this is a sixty six hundred shown there. It's the it's the most commonly deployed device that we have into a retail environment. It's our own design from the board upwards. It's got our own operating system on it. And as shown here, it's typically connected um, to a, a store's primary broadband connection. We can deliver managed broadband with our service, or we act in what's called a BYOB, a bring your own broadband mechanism, where we plug into whatever the customer's got. Um, the devices themselves are controlled by the central management system. So if you've got access to the central management system and your credentials give you the ability to administer or look at or manipulate that device, you can see it and do what you're allowed to see and do. Our devices have built-in cellular connections. So this particular device, depicted in cartoon form here, has a dual SIM cellular module, um, and that can be used at the same time as the primary broadband with load balancing and packet mirroring and things. 
But what we see more commonly is people are wanting the most bang for their buck in terms of staying connected. And today, in the markets in which we operate, cellular data is expensive compared to wired broadband data, and so people choose to use cellular as failover only. They only want to use that cell data uh, when they have to. And so our platform allows that to happen as well. Customers can choose, hey, my broadband needs to be down for a certain period of time. It might be five seconds, might be three minutes. And if it's been down for that period of time, flip to cellular. When the broadband comes back, if it's been stable for a specific period of time, might be three minutes, might be 15 minutes if it's a super flaky DSL circuit. Once it's stabilized, drop off the cellular, go back to the broadband. We have other customers that rely on uh, their connectivity being up for voice calls. Companies that are doing outbound sales calls and things, they don't want to lose a customer in the middle of a call. So they will use, they'll have, in this example, both circuits up at the same time with packet mirroring going across them. So if they lose one circuit, the call stays up, they haven't lost a potential customer on the line. So that's sort of one end of the failover, i.e. no downtime at all unless the store's unplugged, for example, or they're unlucky enough and both circuits go down. Most operate on a sliding scale. They're saying, okay, I really only want to use one circuit at a time and I'm going to balance how much I use that depending on how long I can stand being offline. For a retail petroleum location, it's typically two minutes. But they, most of them can, can be unimpacted if they're offline for two minutes and that saves them money in sell data costs. Now you can also hijack, this device is, this typical edge device is capable of having four connections going into it. So three wired and a cellular. Not many customers are going to that extreme, but they can. Yeah, what is the realistic configuration for most retail? Most of what's shown here, primary broadband, secondary cellular, that's it. That's what most people use because they, they stay up. It's super reliable. Our hardware has a 40 year mean time between failure rate. So the hardware very rarely fails if ever, particularly if they have it plugged into a surge protector. Um, all of our devices can have dual pairing HA with a heartbeat cable running between them so that, you know, even if you have a hardware failure, it stays up. Almost no endpoint customers use it. People use that technology a lot for the concentrators, which we haven't really spoken about yet, to make sure the head end stays up all the time, but they typically don't for the small sites, although they all support that technology. They support dual power supplies? These ones do not. The typical edge device don't. Some of the VPN concentrators do. Um, interestingly, most people use the non-dual power supplied concentrators because uh, when I, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about our VPN cloud technology, but it's designed to stack up multiple concentrators anyway. So the fact there's multiple concentrators in a stack, that, that really can do away with the, yeah. the dual power supplies. So a typical retailer will also have one of our managed switches. And the scale guys here on the, the, the Intel Nook stuff they were demonstrating before, it's plugged into a Mako managed switch. They've been managing that from the cloud. Um, so that's one of them sitting over there. Most, most end customers are now are starting to use managed switches so that they can segment their networks as appropriate. So this is a pretty basic segmentation diagram, but if you're a retailer, you're probably going to segment your point of sale network from your, your voice network, from your back office, from your guest Wi-Fi, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the system is designed um, to segment those networks as appropriate. Our edge devices include Wi-Fi built into them, so for a, and it's it's really powerful. But if you have a larger footprint location, we're just doing a, in the middle of doing a um, deployment to a new fuel brand in Mexico. Mexico is a full service uh, fuel country, and so there's people in the forecourt with handheld point of sale machines. You, know, you put your credit card in while you're still sitting in the driver's seat. They have Wi-Fi in the canopies, so we have a, our access points can extend the reach of that edge uh, edge Wi-Fi if a customer needs it. The vast majority of our deployments, these small sites, need to connect to all sorts of online application providers. Everything from credit card payment hosts to loyalty processing hosts to mobile payment hosts. If you've ever used your cell phone to buy gas in a forecourt, for example, or to order food in a restaurant, it's amazing how that technology works because when you think about it, your cell phone is not connected to the store's network at all. It's connected to the internet via your phone carrier. So if you've ordered gas, if you've filled up with gas at a gas station and ordered via your phone, that phone is connecting to the internet. How does it get into the store and unlock the dispenser? If it's at a brand that we work in, it's over our VPN. So the, that phone is talking to a <laughs> processor in the cloud that then has to somehow get into the store's point of sale network and then say to the store, hey, someone at pump seven has their credit card's been validated, unlock that pump, allow them to fill it. And then when they go out, send a receipt, which comes back in through the internet. So anyway, there's a lot of 
quite frankly, amazing connectivity requirements that, that these businesses have that no one ever thinks about. If you've ever had a bought one of those gift cards from the racks in, uh, at any store that have everything from Amazon to Applebee's or whatever, there's, a, there's, there's one main company that processes those things, and you need to be able to connect to that securely to check if that gift card actually does have 100 bucks on it, things like that. So these businesses need these, uh, these connections. You might also think, well, why don't they just connect straight over the internet to these service providers using um, HTTPS or TLS or one of these technologies? And for a lot of these businesses, it comes down to credit card security. So if your point of sale system needs to connect to a service online, your PCI burden is massively increased if you're allowing that payment network to connect to the internet. You want to keep it off the internet as much as possible. So utilize an SD-WAN style connection, effectively jumping over the internet to get to the application host. You've also got equipment in stores that need to be supported by third parties. So if you think of the point of sale system delivered by companies like Verifone, if the customers uh, if the customer at the retail location has called Verifone for help with, their, with the Verifone system, how does Verifone get into that store and troubleshoot that equipment? It's in a really sensitive environment with all sorts of payment information flowing through it. Well, chances are they come in over our SD-WAN connection. Also, if you're a large dealer group, if you think of these gas station brands, the, the fuel brand themselves probably owns anywhere from 3 to maybe 10% at the most of their stores. The rest of them are owned by franchisees. And these franchisees typically own anywhere from 10 to 500 of the locations. So they're pretty big organizations in their own right. And they in turn want access into the back office systems. They want to be able to see the CCTV at their stores. They want to be able to have real-time information on, if they're a gas station, the level of the fuel in the underground tanks. If they're a restaurant um, or a cafe, they want to make sure that the refrigeration temperatures are, are accurate and they get that information across our VPNs. Quick, quick question. We've mentioned a couple of times about payment information, about how it flows across you know, specific networks. Hasn't the card industry done a lot of solving in that with tokenization and where we're not actually transmitting card or customer information data, right? I'm, I'm transmitting it the token has. of the hash. It has. So there's not really payment information? Well, it depends on your industry. And it also depends on the retailer. So to get to that point costs the retailer a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you want to as a retailer, support things like uh, P2PE, point-to-point -point encryption, which encrypts the, best case scenario, encrypts the credit card at the read head, and then it's a token in the store, and then it goes somewhere and gets, and then the, uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, it sends the, the uh, anyway, so it sends the data in a. It's not credit card data flowing across the customer's network. But most retailers today don't support it because the payment hosts aren't the people that are unencrypting that card data. It would be easy. The POS vendor, right? No, it's typically not. It's typically a third party that's that's doing the uh, the unencryption. Then they send the the data in the clear, um, usually over a VPN to the payment processor. It comes back to them with authorized. They then send a token back to the store. That costs the store money, and it costs the store money that comes out of a specific budget that isn't gonna generate the many new customers and is really like paying extra money for insurance. Our type of technology can deliver a very similar result to them, re relieving their PCI burden at a much greater, at a greatly reduced cost. So that's the business case, right? We're talking a financial case. Of Everything. Like, do I want to spend the tokenization aspect yeah. with the payment provider or can I go down the path with Mako and network? And have some spare money to do, to do some marketing that are gonna, that's going to make a real difference to my business. Okay. As you get involved in you know, the credit card business and banking, you realize everything comes down to uh, how much does this cost versus what is the risk. Right. Everything. PCI came about because the credit card schemes got sick of it. Credit card fraud got to a point where they just couldn't absorb it, and so they had to start pushing some, some of the cost and the risk back onto the merchants. It, it's it's all, I mean it's as simple as that. It's just give and take. Like every single one of us, when we've we've got our personal budgets and our home budgets, we you know we're weighing up: do I spend money on this or do I spend money on that? Unfortunately, point to point encryption falls into that category. If a, the payment hosts, you know, the major commercial payment hosts did the encryption and they said, yeah, we're just going to deliver this as part of our service, no brainer. And that's what most people think should be happening, but it's not the reality. Okay. It's not how it works. Thanks. But even, I will go on to say, even if they did that, every loyalty card that you swipe at a, at a vendor, that's got personally identifying information about you going somewhere else. That's got to be protected. Um, 
The CCTV systems in a store are a great way for a criminal to case a store to rob it without actually going there. So you need to protect that information. Um, the underground fuel tanks in, um, in gas stations, um, there's websites you can go to that have identified gas stations that have those that are exposed to the internet with default usernames and passwords, and you can just go and get a, get a fuel truck trick delivered to a store or the store to think that its tanks are still full and it's going to run out and go out of business, which is kind of a stupid thing to do, but this stuff happens everywhere. You got, it's not just credit card data that needs to be protected. But yeah, when I learned what I just explained, so I was like, uh -huh. why doesn't that happen? Because it makes sense to, to do it the way most people think it should. So great segue into our VPN technology. So we have this technology called VPN Cloud. It's, our, uh, it's one part of our SD-WAN solution for customers. So um, let's stick to the credit card analogy and pretend that over here on the right-hand side, data center A and data center B, that's a credit card processing host. Most credit card processing hosts have at least two data centers. So that's why there's two data centers over there. And the customer over here on the left their payments network needs to send card data to the payment processor for, for processing. We might put in three of our Mako VPN concentrators on the edge of each of those data centers. And then via the CMS, we'll wrap those six concentrators up into a single entity to manage we call a VPN cloud. So there's six concentrators spread across two data centers that is our payment host VPN cloud. Then we simply connect the payment network payment VLAN from that store to that cloud. And that store will connect to all six concentrators at once. And it will randomly be assigned one of them as its primary route into the payment host network. Now, if that concentrator fails, circuit fails, maybe data center A is having problems today, the impacted Mako connected sites are connected to all the other concentrators in that cloud anyway. They do an instant route change, they stay connected, no downtime. Same methodology lets us say, take data center B offline for a week, while the payment processor is doing uh, application updates. So it's out of the cloud temporarily, no customer impact. We can then add it in, add it back in. Again, no customer impact. If they want to add a third data center, we can add more concentrators to the cloud. If they want to expand by adding more concentrators, they can do that. And they can do all this without any customer impact. And we spoke about virtualization before. We can deploy those concentrators in a virtualized manner without having to actually put anything into a data center, which means we could spin up a cloud like that in about an hour and a half, without ever having to go on site, without having to rack anything, cool anything, power anything, whatever that needs to happen. So those concentrators could just as easily be deployed in any of the main cloud vendors environments. And then instead of plugging an ethernet cable into the network, we do an IPsec tunnel out the back of them and we'd normally cross connect to both data centers. And each of these tunnels is kind of dedicated to one application, right? So you have different applications for different is within the branch. It's typically different destinations. So, you know, this in this example, that's going for the payment host. Now, if this was a, you know, a retailer that had that needed a connection to payments, they'd have this. If they needed connections to loyalty, that's going to be provided by a completely different vendor. So they're going to have a, a similar, probably with less concentrators, because loyalty is probably less important to them than payments is, then it'll be another cloud. The cloud concentrators can actually be multi-tenanted too. So there's no reason that these concentrators, rather than just going into data center A and B from, uh, for payments, they could actually also have connections going into the loyalty host and the customer would see it as two clouds they can pick from, but it's going through the same hardware, either physical or virtual. So is this just industry standard IPsec or is this proprietary? The back end. Yeah, is IPsec because we're connecting into non mako equipment typically at the data center. So on the virtualized one, we do an IPsec tunnel from each concentrator into each data center, normally cross-connected. The front end of it, where frankly the magic happens is our own stuff. It's TLS-based with a whole lot of wrappers and controls. So the, cust the customer's store doesn't need public IP addresses. They don't need static IP addresses. They, it automatically reforms when they're on cellular. If the cellular is up at the same time and they're doing packet mirroring, that all happens. So it just makes it completely seamless and transparent to the customer. Do you also support um, industry standard IP that as yep. a yep. destination from the... Yep, the edge device. Like, edge and device. quite often if a, a say a smaller uh, franchise group has a head office and they've got a you know, Cisco or a Palo Alto or something in their head office that supports IPsec and they want a VPN in without using Mako equipment, no problem. Yep. And we also support uh, things like OpenVPN, so application uh, style VPNs on the edge device if the store manager wants to get into their back office network 
from their phone or tablet or laptop, they can do that. OpenVPN is supported by just about every operating system known to man, and, and they can do that. Yeah. Yeah, question. Do, uh, does Mako broker the conversation with all of those other vendors like the loyalty payment, the financial payment processors? So you ha already have relationships in place of in, in the ecosystem of Mako going to market with scale and everything else we've, t we've talked about today, mm -hmm. you can say, hey, if you, if you add on Mako networks, I can get you to all these payment providers. Is that yes, part of the concept? Yes, that's one thing we can do. And a lot of that is going to depend on who we're selling to. So we have a VPN cloud partner program that's open for anybody with, with online applications to put Mako concentrators on the edge of their network. And we, we have... Um, uh, you know, major gift card vendors, major loyalty schemes, major back office processing companies. So these companies that are offering solutions to distributed enterprises, we have um, a really cost-effective way for them to put Mako concentrators in their environment. And so then for customers that are already using us, they can say, hey, I want to connect to vendor ABC, click the go button, it's already there, done. But then if we're doing, a, um, if we're, uh, doing business with a new retail brand that we haven't done business with before, and they're a major retail brand, a lot of them don't want shared connections. So we might already have uh, uh, concentrators on the edge of a payment host that they are using, and they say, nope, we want our own stuff in dedicated to our retailers. That's no problem either. We can do that too. So, And then some customers have a mix. They might say, payments need to be put in, uh, need to be ours. We don't want to share with anyone else, but we're cool with sharing the um, IoT sensor monitoring, and we're cool with sharing the gift card mon uh, gift card processing services, like, things like that. So it can be a mixture. So is the customer use case that they're trying to keep their different types of traffic of their own segmented from each other, like payment card versus gift card versus monitoring versus whatever management, or is it that they're trying to keep all of their traffic segmented from all of somebody else's traffic? Which of the, the things is the goal for having these tunnels? It really depends on the customer. So the primary goal for having these tunnels, um, there's, there's typically two primary goals. One is PCI compliance, because they, they if they're connecting from a, it's called the CDE, the cardholder data environment at their store. So the network segments that have credit card data on them, if they're connecting from them to the host, they want to keep that network off the internet. So it's got no internet access at all. They, they jump over the internet using those tunnels. Um, the other key reason is that VPN Cloud makes that application provider super resilient to that customer. There's no longer just one entry point into that, or they're not relying on DNS to, to do round robining to hit their different access points. If they've got eight concentrators at two data centers, they've got eight levels of resiliency just for them to get into that provider's environment. So um, it's really security, compliance, reliability. That's why they use them.